Okay, so uh, this is based on work that I started when I was a postdoc with Amelia Frizzoli um, in collaboration with Kevin Spiesser, who's now at Uber. Uh, seems to be where most of the people working on this sort of topic end up at. So, okay, so there are many types of mobility on demand systems that are available now. Uh, I'd classic, classify them into three categories. There are station based systems, so bike sharing that we heard about in the morning, um, and SIPCA, which is one of the oldest car sharing systems in the US. There are also things that are on-demand taxi services like Uber, Lyft, and traditional taxis. And then thirdly, there are systems that are floating systems. Right? So um, Cardigo is, is less known in the US. It's a, a spin-off from Daimler that has services in North America and Europe. And this is a free floating system where you go on your cell phone, you look for a car that's close to you, uh, you make a reservation, you walk to it, you drive it, and you park it wherever you want to, as long as it's a legal street parking spot. Or, or some garages that they have deals with. So they take care of all the parking, you just take it and park it wherever you want to park it. Right? So there are these kinds of systems available, and we're interested in modeling these systems and understanding how to optimize these fleets. So I'm going to be talking mostly from the perspective of the fleet operator in this talk. Okay. So one way to model these systems is to think of them as a station-based system. So even if the system inherently isn't station-based, we can approximate it using, uh, by assuming that the, all the demand can be clustered into a set of stations. And once you do that, you can get a graph where the nodes correspond to these stations and the edge weights correspond to the travel times. So to illustrate how such a system would work, I'm going to just first show you an example from a, a simulation of such a system in Singapore. So the red dots here are actually the stations that, that uh, we've clustered the demands into. Uh, the, the blue dots moving are vehicles with passengers and red dots are vehicles moving without passengers to rebalance them sells to locations where passengers are at. And in the morning rush hour, now you see these uh, residential areas, these this clouds growing. These are people queuing up to get a taxi. And you see the red dots moving towards those clouds. Right? So now midday again, things are slowing down. There's still quite a bit of movement, but there's not a need for a lot of rebalancing because the demand is fairly um, um, uniform across the different stations. Now, as we get again to the evening rush hour, you'll see that these clouds are starting to appear. This is the downtown area, so we'll see most of the activity is down there. And you'll see this stream of red cars coming into the downtown area to rebalance themselves to sort of satisfy this demand. Right? So this was a thought experiment done in Singapore based on uh, survey data from there. And uh, one of the outcomes of this uh, study was that approximately 300,000 shared vehicles could support the demand of 800,000 passenger vehicles in Singapore with peak time waiting times of roughly 15 to 20 minutes, which is not bad uh, given the reduction, large re reduction in the number of vehicles that are used. But one in th interesting thing here is that you still need 300,000 cars. And if these cars aren't autonomous cars, then that means there need to be 300,000 people, 300, people driving, driving everyone else around, which doesn't seem so realistic. Okay, so something to think about, and something about the case for autonomous vehicles. So going into the, uh, how we actually solve these problems, so if it's a station-based problem, it turns out that for many different types of uh, problems where the demand is static, periodic, time varying, or online, the problem can actually be formulated as a linear program. Right, so here is the, it's a very simple case of the static demand. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details of the exact formulations, but the point here is that all of these problems, with, when it comes to a single rider sharing problem, single rider car sharing problem, can be formulated as a LP, which allows us for fast solution methods. So we took this approach and we tried it with some data from car to go and we applied four different types of rebalancing strategies and looked at what kind of insights the fleet operator could get out of this. So here the x-axis is the fleet size, Y-axis is what I'm calling the number of dropped customers or walkaways, and this is defined as customers who waited for more than six minutes for a ride and then just left the system. So we assume that people leave the system after waiting for six minutes. And the four curves here uh, correspond to four uh, strategies. The green one here is when you don't do any rebalancing. So you only get a ride if the taxi or car happens to be where you need it. This curve here corresponds to what I call feedback rebalancing. So when a demand appears, a car moves towards that demand. Okay? So if there, is not, if there doesn't exist a vehicle close enough to your demand, it will not be satisfied. And then we can look at uh, this feedback re uh, plus proportional rebalancing strategy where we look at some kind of forecast of the future demand and we rebalance the vehicles based on that fo forecast. 
And this forecast can take many forms. In this specific case, we just simply looked at the demand from the previous week at the same time. Okay? You can do much better than that. And the final one is when you actually know exactly what happens in the future. So this is the best you can do, the blue curve here. Right? So obviously you see as you increase the fleet size, the performance increases, and after some point there are diminishing returns of increasing the fleet size. Another metric we can look at is the total number of empty vehicle miles traveled. So from fleet operator's point of view, I don't want to just move vehicles without passengers in them because this adds to my operating cost. And so this adds the, num the fleet size adds to my <coughs> fixed cost, and the number of empty vehicle miles traveled adds to my operational cost. So you can see again here, as the fleet size increases, the rebalancing trips increase, because when you have very small fleet sizes, regardless of where the vehicle is, there is a demand. But as you increase the fleet size, now you have opportunities to service demand that's not at your station, but that requires moving these vehicles around to the stations that, where the demand is. And again, as the fleet size grows beyond a certain threshold, you don't need to rebalance because you have enough vehicles all over the place. So again, the total empty vehicle miles travel decreases. So as you can, you might notice there are different, objective, uh, different uh, objectives that we can have when we are dealing with the rebalancing problem. And as a fleet operator, you have to sort of balance off these different criteria. Right? So here we, we came up with a sort of a, uh, what we call a normalized operational cost, which takes into account the lost revenue from drop trips, the f uh, cost of operating a certain fleet size, and the cost of the rebalancing trips, and try to figure out from the operator's perspective what is the best point at which they should operate. Right? So in this case, it turns out that the feedback plus proportional rebalancing works best, and the fleet size that they should operate it as, at is really small. Now, of course, this, again, is a system, like David mentioned earlier, where the more supply there is, the more users actually come into the system. So this is not taking into account the fact that there is some notion of induced demand in the system. So whereas this analysis says this, the, this is the best operating point, maybe the operator should initially operate at a higher point here, even though the profit to the operator is lower, just to account for potential future profits. So this kind of analysis turns out is very important to the fleet operators to kind of understand how to manage their operations. And you can also see that this initial data, where this was for Seattle, if you look at Vancouver, for example, the curves look quite different. So from city to city, the strategies might be different. Right? OK, so what are some of the problems with, with such a system? Uh, is such a system scalable? Is it sustainable? One of the major problems with the single rider sharing systems is that the total vehicle miles traveled in such a system is actually greater than private vehicle ownership because of all of these rebalancing trips. So if you want to have a, a very efficient system, you have to do a lot of rebalancing. And that means that you're increasing the total number of vehicle miles traveled. So this is not good. One solution to that is ride pooling. But as soon as we introduce ride pooling, all these nice linear programming approaches that we have to solve this problem go away. So what we're interested in now in looking at is what are the strategies that are still scalable and work but can handle ride pooling? Starting with the question of what if we only want to share a car with two passengers instead of one? Okay. So there was some really nice initial work, uh, work on this topic done uh, in a 2014 paper uh, that was published in PNAS, um, where they defined this thing called the scal uh, shareability network. And this is a very simple concept. So, so I have these uh, bunch of trips here, and I say two trips are shareable if, uh, I, I put an edge between the two trips if they are shareable in the sense that combining those two trips together does not increase the individual travel time of any rider beyond a threshold. Okay? Turns out that if I do that, uh, I can solve this as a max maximum weight matching problem, the allocation, and the complexity for sparse networks is n squared logged in. So it's not great, but it's for reasonable problem sizes, it's fast enough to compute online. The problem here that is that it does not account for vehicle assignment, because you're just matching riders here, but you're not taking into account where the vehicles are. So you might not have the opportunity to, this might actually work in practice, because the vehicles might not be there. Um, so, uh, so it turns out that you can actually solve this in suit changes, where you first solve the matching problem, and then go back to the LP solutions that I talked about earlier to do the vehicle rebalancing. Uh, so it's a decoupled approach, which is not optimal uh, in a system, uh, optimal in the coupled sense, but gives you approximation of the, of the solution. 
Okay, so I'm going to skip this because I'm a bit uh, short in time, but the, the, another sort of uh, limiting factor of this approach is that it doesn't allow for trip chaining. For example, something where I have a trip like this and I have a smaller trip, I can't other, add another trip to this and route in this approach. So we've been working on some strategies for being able to solve this coupled problem. Turns out you can solve it as a mixed integer linear program. Um, and you can use the solution to the decoupled problem and solutions from previous iterations of this online problem as an initial solution to this problem. So uh, just to finish off, uh, we're also looking at some other extensions to this where we, we want to couple the, the vehicle routing problem with transit systems. So this is an example from Washington, D.C., where, where we're trying to say what if people could take a mobility on demand system to the transit station and then use that as a first and last mile solution. And then to finish off, this is also part of a larger effort here at Cornell where we're looking uh, uh, to work with policymakers and fleet operators to create mathematical models and tools to help them with large scale decision making. And here's a bunch of people that we are working with. Thank you. Thank you. Point here. I don't think we have time for a question. We'll have um, a quick one. Yeah, quick one. Um, why not uh, uh, change the pricing so that the, the return trips are either free or paid, and then you, people, there's always cars going all directions, so why can't we just uh, price it so that the return trips happen on that? Yeah, so there's a lot of work also that I didn't get into on people trying to do this. So Cardigo, for example, is trying to give people incentives to park in locations where there's demand. Um, so and search pricing and things like that also. There are many strategies to all the demand and supply to do that. Uh, so it's something that people are doing, but didn't have time to get into it. Thank you. Thank you.